is it that you find so fascinating about ancient Egyptians, Dr. Ikram? Well, actually, I have to say that I wanted to come to Egypt because I was given the Time Life book on ancient Egypt for my eighth birthday, which slightly helped replace the Egyptians, um, the Minoans, in my affections. And then my father brought me here. So I think what's fascinating about the ancient Egyptians is, A, of course, it's beautiful. Their art is beautiful. Their objects are beautiful. Everything is not only pretty, but it has a meaning, which is fascinating. And I think that the just when you look at tombs and you see the kind of lives that the Egyptians lived and the detail into which you can enter their lives, I think that makes it particularly marvelous and compelling to people. One of your specializations is funerary archaeology. Well, I started into animal mummification because I was working on food. And if you preserve food, which is preserving meat, that's where you get your mummies. And when I was young, when I first came here, one of my favorite rooms in the Cairo Museum was the animal mummy room. It was sort of the room of the flora and fauna of Egypt. And since that time, it had fallen into some disrepair. And so I thought that I should refurbish it, and that's how I got into the animal mummies. And uh, since for my dissertation I've been working on meat, which encompasses a lot of animals, um, it sort of segued quite logically. How far are we to understanding the chemical process of mummification? Well, we have been doing a lot of work on it. Many scholars all over the world have been working on recreating mummification. And just now I was in Bristol working with uh, Dr. Richard Eversham and his team, and we feel that we are going ever closer to finding the right balance of what it takes to make mummy. So I've come back happy to do some more experimental work with my students because in the spring semester 2015 we're having death and burial in ancient Egypt. And so for the death class, I think we'll do more experimental work which will feed into this. So I'm hoping that we will, we will never know exactly, because in fact, like any, any recipe, there's not just one recipe, there are little riffs on it. So we're working our way to at least having our version of it. We don't experiment with mummies we found, but we use what we learn from those mummies to inform our experiments. So when you dig something up, when you look at how the, what color the skin is, or the consistency of the resins, or the smell of something, or how it powders, it gives us a, something to work with when we are back in the lab. There's been this very controversial story about the virtual autopsy of Tutankhamun. How far should archaeological techniques go? I mean, talking about scanning methods, digital imaging, DNA, and so forth. Um, I think it is perfectly legitimate to do a virtual autopsy of someone, whether they are a commoner or a king, but I think it should be within the confines of good taste. Um, I think that as long as one treats the king and his remains with respect, um, it is a useful thing to do. And I think we can, science can learn a great deal, but of course sometimes it's how it's presented, and sometimes some presentations are a bit more vulgar than others. I think it would be very nice to have a lot of this information out in the scholarly world as well as on television. It would be quite useful for all concerned. You once estimated that about 70% of Egypt's treasures still are buried in the sand. In your opinion, should all archaeological sites be excavated and uncovered? It's a real problem to have so much of ancient Egypt buried under the earth because it's always a, a war, almost, between the living and the dead. And I think that Egypt's population is excessively large and should be controlled, but that doesn't mean, you know, I want people to be kicked out of their houses. But I do think that places that have been delineated as antiquity site should be respected, the parameters should be respected, and also there are some places that are sort of borderline. So what we need to do there is do three seasons of intensive rescue archaeology. And unless you find something that's mind-blowing, once you have that data, let people build. But don't let them build without knowing what's there, because that is, I think, a crime. Um, because this way, we at least can have a picture, it won't be a complete picture ever, of what went on here in the past. But otherwise, if people just willy-nilly take over all over the, the country, um, land that should belong to the antiquities, then I think we will 
we lose, and I think not just us in Egypt, but all of humanity is going to lose a huge amount of information and our common heritage and culture, not just in terms of pretty things, but also in terms of how people lived, how they thought, how they dealt with their day-to-day -day problems, which is very important because it connects us to our past, no matter whether we live in Egypt or India or, you know, Timbuktu. As you excavate and you have these beautiful sites available for people to visit, is it better to some extent to keep them in the sand rather than bring them out for the public to admire but at the same time damage? Where Are you saying vandalism or are you talking about people who dig them up themselves, uh, the scientists? Well, yeah, vandalism would be the extreme case but I mean also just the wear and tear of having like so many tourists come and perhaps think well, they can just take a little... Okay. Yes, I think that certain things, a percentage, should be exposed and should be used to educate the public. Um, I think the public needs to be educated not just in terms of what they're seeing, but how you behave in an antiquity site. And the public comes from not just Egypt, but I've seen people from France and England and Germany and Italy behaving in the most appalling manner in the Cairo Museum. Um, you know, sort of groping at things, wanting to write their names on things. It's shocking to me that people think that they can come and behave this way in a museum, leave alone an open archaeological site. So I'm saying that it is an international problem. People's manners need to be corrected. And the idea that these are very valuable and precious things that we should all look after needs to be emphasized. So I think that schools in Egypt and all over the world need to teach children and people how to behave in relation to cultural heritage, no matter where they are. When you are in these amazing sites and you're working on an excavation site or, or in a burial chamber, do you ever feel an energy field? Do you believe in this? I, I think that places all over that have power and I think especially places that are more like temples in fact because people go there and pray whether it's a church or a mosque or a temple or a uh, what have you people leave their energy smears I think by belief and so sometimes when you go into a space you will feel if you are that way inclined um, some of the residual energy I get my students to read Terry Pratchett, The Smallest God, which is all about a god who had shrunk in size because no one believed in him. But as people believed, he grew and grew in strength. It's sort of like Tinkerbell and fairies, clap their hands. But I think that, that spaces do retain energy of belief that people have poured into them, and they reflect that back. I think in tombs I feel that less than I do in temples, um, because they are less intensely visited um, and less intensely prayed in, as it were. Um, but sometimes, of course, one has sort of funny feelings and you think, oh, gosh, it's almost as if someone else is here. Um, but I think that that could just be pure fantasy or it could be reality. Is there an example? Well, I think a lot of people find that Dendera is a place of, of great power which is interesting because it's such a young temple with standing. But there'll be moments in Karnak Temple, which will be, you know, two or three of us were walking through it, and it was on the night of the rising of Sothis, and we all had a, suddenly, pew, all of the hair on the nape of our neck stood up, and we scurried out there. We were close to the Holy of Holies, and we felt, we should not be here now. And we raced out of there, and some of us were quite grown up. If there was one thing in Egyptology that you would like the answer to, what would it be? Oh, that's impossible. One thing. One thing? A thing. Okay. I would like to know how in the 5th dynasty people went to the bathroom in their homes and disposed of their waste and where they put it, and if there were any issues associated with human waste disposal in terms of health. Fair enough. I'm very interested in the nitty-gritty of people's daily lives. And it would also be quite nice to see which one of the many theories of how the Great Pyramid was built is actually true. 
What would be the biggest challenge for an archaeologist working in Egypt like yourself? I mean, is it the weather conditions? Is it the bureaucracy? It depends on where you are, because sometimes it is the weather conditions. In Kharga Oasis, it is very extreme. It's extremely hot, it's extremely cold, and it's extremely windy. Um, and so there, there are few moments where it's pleasant and lovely to work there. But those few hours are very nice. So I think weather is, is a problem, but I think and bureaucracy is sometimes a problem, but finances are the largest and most consistent challenge for archaeologists. As we try and work in an increasingly scientific way, we have to have the machinery and the support and the analyses, and it costs a lot of money. We could just, you know, dig holes in the ground like vandals do, but if we really want to squeeze out information we need to do this properly and that's what costs a lot of money and it's not just the digging but it's all the analyses that are done afterwards and people sometimes say oh I have the money for the dig but they don't think it's as cool or sexy to fund the post excavation work and the publication which is what is the most important thing in a way because that's where everyone gets access to information and without publishing we are no better than tomb robbers Anything we do must be put forward. The, even the raw data needs to be put out so that once people have that, they can use it and analyze it, make up their own minds. And they can also have, you know, my version and my publication. But still. What projects are you currently working on? I'm working on, with, there's a German team of which I am a part. Um, we're working on the leather and the gold and the sort of the trappings of Tutankhamun's chariots Chariot. and uh, that is we're starting we, we, the week work's been going on but I'm going back to work tomorrow uh, with my colleague uh, who works with me on leather Andrew Bel Beldmeyer and uh, this is under the direction of Christian Ekman so we're in the Cairo Museum looking at scraps of leather and trying to figure out what the leather was whether it's cow or goat or something else how it was prepared how it was decorated, what was used, whether it was glues or you know, sewing or all of the technology for this. Um, that's one project. Another project is working with Andre Weltmeier on Tutankhamun's sticks and staves. He has over 130 sticks and some people, as in this weekly said, ah, oh, he had all these sticks because he couldn't walk properly. Frankly, I have a stick because I can't walk work properly and two or three is more than enough, one for every outfit. Um, we also have to remember that sticks and staves were marks of power. So we have them all throughout um, Egyptian history being buried with people of all ranks. So whether they were low rank or high rank, they had at least a couple of sticks with them. So, of course, if you're a king, you're going to have more. So I think it doesn't necessarily prove that he could not walk, because also we would be paying special attention to the bottom to see if there are marks of wear. Because if there are not many, and we have not come up with very much at all, then these are either he had another one that he used for every day, and these are for just, you know, hello, I'm here as the god Horus, or hello, I'm here as Amun, or whatever. Um, and they weren't really giving him support. But even, even if you use them a few times, because they're gilded at the bottom, I know you would put some weight on them, and some of them are very skinny. And they're too high to really give you the kind of support you need if your leg is bad. So you can't depend upon some many of these. And since Tutankhamun is only a few inches taller than I am, I could hold the sticks and have a sense of where he might be his hand. I'm sort of consulting with a Hungarian team directed by Thomas Baksh in uh, Luxor. I'm also working with uh, a team working on rock art, recording rock art, directed with, by Derek Hooker in the Eastern Desert and actually along the Nile. Uh, my own project is the North Kharga Oasis Dal of Aina Moor survey, which is in Kharga Oasis where we're doing a big survey of the whole area and we're looking at things that go from Paleolithic all the way to the Roman period. Um, working in the Valley of the Kings with a Swiss team and also with uh, and the field director for Dr. Otto Schaden in KD63 as well as KD10. I work as a funerary archaeologist with um, 
Jose Galan, and uh, I also work as a archaeozoologist with a mummy specialist for teams in Amhida and Abides and a couple of others. So basically, I'm involved with 15 projects um, that I work on a little bit here and there. And of course, I teach at the American University in Cairo. With your extraordinary career so far, what would what would be the high point? There have been a few. I've been really, really, really lucky. You know, when my parents said, "Oh, what are you doing going into this? You'll never have a job. And I said, okay, let me at least do my PhD and then I'll wash dishes for the rest of my life if I have to. Um, I've been extraordinarily fortunate to be able to do something I love. And, well, being part of the KV-63 tomb, mm. that no tomb had been found in the Valley of the Kings since 1922. So for us, that was wow, to actually go in, open these jars that had been sealed in about 13 or 15 BC and be the first person since the person whose fingerprints were on it to, to go in and look at what's inside was tremendous. In the Sudan, I've opened tombs of 4th century BC um, and been the first person to, to look. And you, know, you open it and there's this, the air goes out and you can smell the incense that was burnt at the funeral and laid in with the tomb. It's amazing. Um, there have been other moments of just fabulousness. CT scanning the crocodile, studying the animal mummies in the Egyptian museum, um, exploring tombs in, in TT11, being, you know, sitting there on one's belly and going in like Belzoni and trying to map this tomb that people haven't been in. It's a lot of fun. I mean, like, it's not all Indiana Jones, and certainly, as they say in the film, 80% of work is done in the library. But the other 20%, um, of which 18% is probably a bit dreary, but that other 2% is amazing. So it's, it's, there's a lot. And sometimes it's just small things, like holding a ceiling where you put your fingers with someone else 3,000 years ago, put their thumb and finger. So it's these little things, these connections, or these eureka moments. You say, oh, I know why you did that. Oh my God, I understand. Um, so it's, it's a great job.